Dave, welcome to the podcast. Hi, thank you. I'm glad to be here. Uh, Dave, I've been looking forward to this conversation a long time. However, uh, this is pretty darn timely because you are actually transitioning into retirement yourself. Uh, I think it's kind of weird for me because you know, I've, I've seen you on a screen many and many times. You've been my you know, professor throughout the years, and I've always just enjoyed learning from you. And now I get to actually see you face to face. It's like you're a real person all of a sudden. <laughs> Thanks. It is uh, this new video approach to education does uh, make it more personal. It is it is different than writing a book. It's, it's, yeah. it's, uh, I like it. It's well, fun. we're getting so online these days. I mean, we're running so many of our appointments, you know, with people all over the country online like this. And so technology has just delivered so much, um, I think, to everyone, you know, especially those in the retirement world looking for the right advisor, looking for the right guidance. And you yourself are finally making that transition into retirement. You might say you've already made the transition into retirement. Can you just tell us a little bit about, you know, what's the retirement day? When's Dave going to, you know, finally hang it up? What's this look like for you? So, you know, I think everybody has their own view of what retirement is. I, I talked to somebody recently that had gone from full-time to part-time and they saw themselves as still working, right? Now, I, I've done that. So at the end of 2019, I went from full-time to part-time. I'm still working at the, at the American College doing course curriculum like I was before. Uh, but in my mind, I retired. I don't go in very much. Uh, you know, I, I mainly uh, work at home. I guess we're all working at home right now uh, during this uh, situation we're in. But, uh, but you know, I work at home. Um, I'm not uh, connected anymore to the politics or, the, or running of the organization. I'm just sort of, you know, pursuing things I enjoy doing. So, so there's a big difference, you know, in my mind. I mean, so to me, I've retired and now I'm just, now I'm trying to spend my time doing things I really enjoy doing. And one of those things is working at the college building course curriculum. Well, what, give us an idea of the timeline. You know, where are you today and you know, what, 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 what would it look like leading up to this? What do you expect in the future? Well, I guess the, uh, you know, as I say, I, I, I ended full-time employment at the end of 2019. It, it definitely felt like retiring because I had to pick a Medicare supplement uh, and uh, join Medicare. And uh, I started my Social Security spousal benefits. I'm, one of, I'm in that last group of people that can claim spousal benefits and then switch to their worker benefits at 70. So I am, I'm 66 is, is my age. And uh, I retired at this age, uh, partially because my spouse is, is uh, 10 years older than I am. And so uh, we wanted to spend more time together. And uh, we do a, we spend a lot of time walking the poodles. <laughs> and so that's, you know, I wanted to have time to do that and enjoy each other while we still are in good health. You know, I think age differences do matter in retirement planning, you know, uh, uh, because, you know, certain things happen to you as you get older. We're both fortunately in very good health and very active at this point, but that's not going to, you know, that's going to change. I, I know that from all the things that I've studied over the years. Yeah, what are you looking forward to the most? Is it teaching? Is it spending time together? Is it the poodles? <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, well, I, you know, one thing is that I want to start to find some new meaning in my life, but I'm sort of not in a hurry to do that. I think one of the things I realized was, uh, as, as this was happening to me, um, that we tell everyone that you need to figure out how you're going to spend your time in retirement. And the reality is you can't really figure that out until you have, until you're in retirement and you have the time to explore these various options. Uh, so I, I feel like some of what I'm doing in the, you know, in the first year is I'm going to take my time and pursue different things and try some things and not try and overcommit to anything. Now, I, I feel like, you know, there are, to me, there's two types of people in the world. There's the people that are always bored and there's the people that think the world is so filled of interesting things to do, they, they can't get enough. And, and I'm in that second category. So, so I'm much more worried about overcommitting to a whole new set of uh, responsibilities and, and, and projects uh, and so I don't really want to do that. So I'm, I'm actually trying to kind of go slowly and just kind of enjoy myself a little bit more. Um, we, uh, as I said, we do spend hours walking the poodles every day. And I've taken a pickleball. This is what old people do is play pickleball. <laughs> um, I'm a lifelong tennis player and I, I still do that as well. But, um, but it's just uh, a pickleball is, you know, you don't run as much and it's, uh, it's just a little more relaxing. People aren't as serious about it and, as they are their tennis games. So. 
So it's a, uh, it's a way to socialize with people my age. You know, I play tennis with people that are 30 years younger than me. So I'm enjoying playing pickleball with uh, sort of age appropriate partners, you know, and, and, and so I feel like I'm getting to know my community, you know, a little bit better because, because of that. So, so I'm, I'm enjoying that. That definitely feels like that's a new activity and it's feels like uh, feels like retirement, you know, yeah. all of us that playing pickleball at nine o'clock on a Monday morning are retired. <laughs> well, and I, you say that you're trying to be cautious not to just overwhelm your schedule, right? And I, I find, you know, you hear it from retirees all the time. You know, I'm busier than I've ever been. And, you know, well, I don't have time to do this. I don't have the time to do that. So is that, you know, on your mind as you made this transition? Were there any specific strategies? Or are you utilizing any specific strategies to make sure you don't reach a point of overwhelm? Um, well, like I say, I'm, I'm just not taking on an, a, a whole lot of new activities, so, you know, all at once. Um, I am doing one, you know, an interesting volunteer activity, which is uh, there's a group, it's young, a Young Entrepreneurs Association, where these high school kids and junior high kids start their own businesses, which is really cool. You know, a 13-year-old starting their business is a, is a cool kid, right? And uh, we help them with their business plans, so, so I'm in a mentoring role doing that, and that's, that's great fun. Um, and I really enjoy that. But uh, as I said, I'm, I'm trying not to take on too many things. I'm still, you know, work is still filling up 15, 20 hours a week of my time. Uh, one of the things I, I definitely wanted to do when I switched from full to part time, though, was I did want to get paid just for the hours that I work because I don't want to, you know, I didn't want to get paid some sort of uh, a monthly stipend that required a, an ongoing commitment. I wanted to get paid if I worked. And if I didn't work, I didn't want to get paid if I was doing other things. So that, that sort of helps. I like that. You know, mentally, I do sort of like that. It's like I say, okay, I'm giving up some of my retirement to work. And I know exactly how much money I'm making when I make that choice, you know, each and every day. So, so I, you know, when you're in a kind of a consulting role, that's, that, that, that's, that's helpful. So. Well, I think these these bridges to retirement are so helpful, and part of that is that you're you're really being deliberate about bringing some of your previous experience in you know and utilizing that as an outlet um, right. to help people. And in working with young entrepreneurs, you're able to I'm sure add so much value to their lives because of your past experience, your education. So you continue to add tremendous value in the world. I'm sure that brings you a lot of joy. Yeah, and I, I would say that I, I try to, um, I, I sort of, you know, have some, haven't quite figured out how I'm going to do this, but, you know, I, when I sort of think of how I want to spend my time, I'd like to take what I know about retirement income planning and share it more with consumers. You know, I've spent my life training advisors, and I feel like I'd like to just help sort of ordinary people, um, you know, and, and so I'm sort of trying to figure out exactly how, how I'll do that. I do, I do that already through writing articles. So I, I write a Kiplinger article periodically, and that's that's one way I do that. But I think I want to, you know, maybe teach in a local night school and, and really get to know some of the, you know, some of my community. I do talk to some of my pickleballers about their <laughs> planning, which is which is fascinating. I mean, people really don't. I'm sure. As, as we all know, people don't know very much about this. And, and I try not to, like, make faces when they talk about how they chose when to claim some security or <laughs> you know, how much they're taking out of their portfolio or whatever. I try not to like react because I, I, you know, I, sometimes I'm horrified by, by what they're doing. So, um, well, why do you think my, that's part of my, my job? Why do you think that is why, why is it that many people just don't know a lot about retirement planning? And I, you know, from what I, this is really why you created the RICP curriculum. Cause it's not right. just that the consumer, the client, the investor doesn't know a lot about retirement income planning, but a lot of advisors haven't had that formal education either. Yeah, when we, we started the program, the RICP program in 2012, really out of it, a need for advisors to learn more about this. I mean, we recognized at that point that the boomers were about to head into retirement, uh, but advisors had learned much more about accumulating assets uh, and knew about investing for people that weren't going to be spending their money right now. Um, but we needed a, a sort of some new tools uh, and, and we needed to train everybody to deal with people that were in the distribution process. And that process has become so much more complicated, as we all know, because people don't have defined benefit pension plans anymore. So they're, you know, I think of all the decisions you have to make uh, around, uh, you know, how you're going to invest your money, 
Uh, what do you do with the ups and downs of the market? Um, my, I've talked to my one of my neighbors recently who, who has a serious health issue and probably has a shorter than average life expectancy and it, you know, has the ability, actually has a pension from work that they're going to decide not to take a life annuity because of their you know, life expectancy issue. And I just sort of explained to her, I said, you know, you know, if you're going to do that, I said, what I like about, you know, just taking the, the life annuities, it's simple. I said, if you're going to do this, now you're going to have to figure out how to invest it. You're going to have to figure out how much you can afford to withdraw from it. You're going to have to like not panic when the market goes up and down. And you're going to have to have some psychological, some approaches that make you comfortable. You know, so we talked about the idea of a, you know, a bucketing approach where you, uh, you know, you buy laddered CDs for the first five years of expenses. And then you feel better about the fact that your other investments are uh, being used for those expenses later in retirement. So if the market goes up and down, you're not as worried. You know, that's such an important issue is, is feeling, feeling comfortable. Like, I feel like um, that's what I've been learning myself as I'm going through this, this process is that you have to, you know, I know a lot of the facts, you know, I mean, I, I've been studying this, right. And I've learned from a lot of experts and I know the facts, but you also have to satisfy the emotional side of your brain as well. You have to feel comfortable. So I'm always encouraging people to, you know, make sure that they're doing things that they feel like they can live with, you know, yeah. I mean, you know, um, I had um, a month and a half ago, uh, I received, you know, a rollover distribution of an enormous amount of money from the college's retirement plan, right? So I rolled into an IRA and, and, and I sat there and I said, okay, should I invest this over time or should I just jump right into the market? And, you know, I thought back to what I've learned from, you know, uh, from, from uh, various people at the college. And I remember Walt War Heidi always telling me that, uh, you know, the research shows that, you know, people that try and dollar cost average over time, they actually don't do as well. Like, it's just so hard to time the market. You're better just jumping in. Mm. So I jumped in. Now, today, I wish I, you know, a month later, now that the market is down, a third, you know, it's, it's worth two thirds what it was worth a month ago. Boy, I wish I had all that cash <laughs> and I could get in at a lower rate. But, but, but you know what, I'm, but I'm not second guessing that decision because I did it carefully. I thought it through. I knew the facts. I emotionally, I was comfortable with it. Um, I also have built a plan that has an income floor in it. So, so I don't need to spend much of my portfolio. So, so that that's the other, that's the other issue is, is if you're going to invest, you know, if you're comfortable and I'm pretty comfortable with the, at the, on the portfolio side, investing fairly aggressively, I still have a lot of income, you know, to deal with the situation that's going on right now. Yeah. And I also have the ability to work a little bit more or a little bit less to supplement that income. So I don't have to spend much of my portfolio. And I was aware of that when I made the decision. So, so I think that it's like, I really thought that decision through carefully, whether I should jump into the market. I did. I'd be a little richer today if I hadn't done that, but I'm okay with it because I, I, I was careful. So I think that, you know, my, what I'm suggesting to people is, you know, I, I think people often don't fully own these decisions. You know, they sort of don't think about them very carefully and then they second guess them and they're uncomfortable with what they decided later, you know, give it a lot of thought, make a good decision. And then, you know, be an adult, you know, live with it, you know? So, so I, I feel like that right now. Now, if the market goes that much further, I'm not sure, you know, I'll still feel like that, but right now I'm feeling okay with the decision I made. Yeah. What you said there uh, brings me back to something Dr. Daniel Crosby said in a previous episode of the podcast. Uh, he's a behavioral finance expert, right? And he, and he's also one of the well, a very well-known asset manager at the same time. So this guy knows what he's doing in the market. And he said, you know, but the reality is that it's not about the best strategy. It's about the one that you can live with. Right. And in your article and Kiplinger observations from the brink of retirement, of which we sent out to all of those subscribers, subscribers we have the weekend reading uh, uh -huh. in that article you said that the strategy has to appeal to both sides of the brain and i think those two things really go hand in hand right mm -hmm. yeah i i think you you want to know the facts and but you also have to feel comfortable emotionally with it with the decisions that you make yeah. you know there well, and there have been times you know before i retired i actually had cut back my risk level for a number of years as i was approaching retirement i was you know, I had to feel comfortable with that. And, uh, you know, and it 
like that, that decision might not have been optimal for my, you know, ultimate portfolio, but it, but it sat well for, for me. So I, I do really think through these things, uh, you know, from all, all different angles. And I really try and own the decision so that, so that I know that, you know, several weeks later, I'm not going to feel uncomfortable with what I had decided. Well, you're so well educated in this realm and you've done so much research and you know, many people just feel overwhelmed because, you know, they've been working, trying to accumulate, just trying to get by for the last 30 or 40 years or just trying to get to a point where they had enough. Now they have enough. They're trying to make this transition. They've got, you know, one advisor telling them one thing, another one telling them another thing. They've, they've got all of this stuff being thrown at them and they don't know, you know, who to believe, who not to believe, which advice to take, which not to take. You know, if someone's feeling overwhelmed and, you know, they, they don't really know what to do. How do they go about this process of educating themselves? I mean, they're probably not going to get to your level of education, but what are some basic steps they should take? Well, I think you want to, you know, one, if you're going to have somebody help you with retirement income planning, so this transition into retirement, you want to make sure that they understand what they're talking about. And so you say you need to know enough in order to pick the right advisor, right? Like, so, so, one of the tools that maybe you can uh, provide a link to, to the listeners of this uh, podcast uh, too is, is a link to a, it's, I call it a, you know, it's a basic description of what retirement income planning is. And if somebody, if you're working with an advisor who uh, says they're going to do retirement income planning for you, if you listen to this, if you work your way through it, you'll see all the things that should be involved. Uh, we've also built um, for the RACP program a much more complicated tool I call the retirement income roadmap. And we also have a link to that. And that just gives you all the details. So if you have a sense of all the things should be done fairly quickly, if you're talking to an advisor, you're going to know whether they're going to do those things for you. Um, I just, as I said, I was talking to my neighbor and we were going through this process that I said, okay, if you're going to get somebody to help you, you know, now that you've decided that you're going to basically live on social security and withdrawals from your portfolio, you're going to need help with someone to, one, decide how you invest it, to decide the tax issues. For this person, the tax issues were a big deal. Like, which account are you going to take your money out of? And, and then third, you're going to have to figure out, like, the, you know, the appropriate withdrawal rate, how much you can afford to withdraw from the portfolio. So, so all those things, you know, like, so, so, so I was suggesting if you're going to talk to somebody, you know, talk to people about it, make sure that they're going to be able to help you with each of those things. It's not just the investments, it's, it's all that other stuff. Yeah. So I think if you read a little bit and you look at some of the information about, you know, what's involved in income planning, then, then you can, you can, you can hear the, you can, you can figure out which advisors know what they're talking about, which ones don't, I think just if by, by educating yourself a little bit. And those two things that I just mentioned, I think are really good to look at, you know, if you are in the process of selecting an advisor. Well, for those that are listening to this podcast, they, uh, they're already on that education train, so they're probably okay, not struggling with that too much. However, you know, things like this, resources are so helpful. We're going to make sure that we go ahead and throw those things in the show notes. And, you know, Dave, I was going to wait a little bit until we got into uh, this regarding your own personal strategy, but it's come up several times here now, and uh -huh. I feel like we've got to dive a little bit deeper in kind of your retirement income plan, your retirement income strategy. And I think we can kind of start this with a question we had from one of our fans. So if you subscribe for weekend reading on our website, retirepurpose.com, we invite you to ask our rock star guests like Dave here uh, questions. And we have a question from Michael Motter, who is actually a, a neighbor of mine uh, in many years ago. And I was excited to see his question come along. And Michael said, as one approaches retirement with adequate retirement funds, what's the most reasonable strategy for for investments that are stable yet produce adequate retirement income and inflation protection? I think that's going to be a question that you are well equipped to answer because you've had to do this for yourself. Well, to, to me that you, you don't have an invest, a single investment that addresses all those issues. You build a plan that addresses those issues. So, so one, you want, you want to make sure you have adequate resources for is you know, for your entire life. So you, you might be building uh, an income floor with annuities or by deferring social security to get more guaranteed income. And then with your investments, you're usually, if you, if you do that with some of your, you know, with some of your money, 
uh, with the rest of your money in your investment portfolio, well, now you're, you're, you know, to deal with inflation, we're usually taking more risk. We're investing in, in, in something that's more aggressive in order to get inflation protection. Um, I, I feel like that's one of those questions where you think we are all looking for an easy answer. And yeah. I'm sorry, there isn't any e- easy answers. It, it, it requires a patchwork, you know, building a plan that has a number of different pieces to it. In order to, I you, you can address all that, but not in. I, I I wouldn't say the answer is an investment or a particular investment. It's, well, uh, and I don't know what your opinion is on this, but I, I think you know that's just something that maybe this generation's not used to. You know, they're they're living in a different environment today than maybe their parents did. You know, we've got right. interest rates at all time lows. We've got you know, well, we did have market valuations at all time highs. Right now, we're having this conversation on March seventeenth, so we've undergone some mar- some volatility. Well, it'll be yet to see what that turns into. But market returns over the last twenty years have been lower than the last average of the last hundred years. So market returns, equity returns have been lower, we've had interest rates lower, and we've also had some changes just to the retirement system itself. And I think that that leads us into our second fan question here from Paulette Bentley is saying, has the experiment of the 401k system as a replacement for pension plans of the past really worked for those who were in mid-career when pensions dropped? So I see that as, you know, did this transition away from pensions to 401ks did that work? And if it didn't work, you know, what, what did that change in retirement planning today versus in years past? Well, when you say, does it, did it work, you know, with 401k plans, you, you make your own decisions, right? So, so like it, it worked for some people who, who, you know, who decided to embrace 401k and, and put, you know, make salary deferral contributions that were significant into the plan. And it, and it didn't work for people who, you know, who chose not to participate. So I, I think that's, so, so one issue is, you know, that's part of the problem with this shift from the DB world to the, the 401k world is now you have a lot of decisions to make that affect your retirement security. Now it worked perfectly fine for me. I actually have some, you know, I have some, I'm one of those, like, I think people of my age often have some uh, modest frozen pension amounts. So I had like a thousand dollars a month from a frozen pension. Uh, you know, that, that, that created part of an income floor for myself. Um, but then, you know, most of my, uh, uh, most of my resources are in a, uh, you know, I'm in a nonprofit college, so it's a 403B plan, but I contributed regularly uh, over the years. Um, you know, I, I, I maxed out when I could. Um, I always saved, I, you know, I changed jobs a couple of times in my career. I always saved those amounts uh, and rolled them over. And, and those, you know, when I was 29 years old, I rolled over $20,000 and that's now $100,000. So these things really do add up as long as you don't spend them. You know, you just have to have good behavior. You can't, you can't spend your pension when you change jobs. You have to uh, contribute regularly. You have to, you know, you have to choose to take some risk in your portfolio. And, and you know, it's not really terribly complicated, but, but it, it is fraught with there are many ways that you can shoot yourself in the foot. <laughs> In well, so you could say system. the 401k system served those well that were diligently saving, you know, that were right. making reasonably good decisions along over on the way to retirement. And then they transitioned into retirement. You know, how has the elimination of pensions and those that say are retiring without a pension, they're retiring just a 401k or a very small pension. I think my grandmother's pension was like, $12 a month. You know, if, if they're making that kind of transition today, they don't have the pensions of, you know, yesterday, how does the current environment affect their planning? How should they be planning differently today? Well, first off, you're, you're, you don't have that guaranteed income for life if you're not getting a monthly pension for life, right? Or, or you know, if you're married, you choose in the past, you'd choose a joint survivor annuity. Uh, so people have less guaranteed income. They often have social security and they have a, maybe a, if they're, if they did well, they've got a big pile of money in their 401k or their 403b plan. And then they have to figure out what to, what to do with that. Now, you know, I always say like in, in my planning, I wanted to have an, a really significant income floor. And I have, um, I'm 66 and I have probably about half of my income as a guaranteed income floor now. And then when I claim my full workers benefit at 70, I'll have like two thirds of my income guaranteed. So I wanted a lot of guaranteed income. 
Um, but if you have, if you if you want to have some guaranteed guaranteed income for life, I always think the first place you look is deferring Social Security. So those people who retire, let's say at six, like I did at sixty six, uh, who have a lot of money in their four hundred one k plan, they're better off starting to spend down some of that money in those first few years and deferring Social Security to seventy in most cases. Mm -hmm. um, there's a fair amount of research. But all, all that research is specific to the facts of a case. But you know, every time I've seen a case that looks at that. You know, should I take Social Security early and uh, hang on to my 401k or should I start spending my 401k and hang on to my Social Security? Um, in most cases, you're better off, you know, deferring that Social Security and starting to spend down your 401k. Right. And um, for, yeah, that's what most that's what we hear. Right. I mean, most of the common advice is you should defer your, defer your Social Security as long as you can. And for the average individual. Yeah. You know, I mean, for the vast majority of individuals. Yeah, they should be doing that. Right. I mean, because most people don't even have enough money to sit, save for the retirement in the first place. So the only way they're going to generate more income is to work longer and continue to defer Social Security. But as you said, that's not the same for everybody. So, you know, I before we go there, though, um, I'm just trying to get a picture of your retirement income strategy. And what I hear is we've got pension, we've got a little pension, we've got uh, social security income that's going to be kicking in later. Uh, we've got some part-time work now that's going to be replaced by social security. You've got some annuity income and that income you said is going to cover about two thirds of your income needs. So if in correct me if I got that picture wrong, but my next question would be where's the other one third come from then? Well, the one third, the additional one third would be either from employment income, from work income, from from my consulting income, or from so so two thirds is covered without any work income. So it, the the difference will be work income or withdrawals from the portfolio. So at some point, you do plan on taking withdrawals from your portfolio once you uh, give up the consulting work. Right. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And and I'm up, and. Like most Americans, most of my money is in a tax deferred plan. All of it becomes taxable when I take withdrawals. I'm subject to RMDs now that now we get to wait till 72. Uh, so uh, you know, so I'll be facing, I'll be facing having to take withdrawals and, and significant withdrawals from 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 the amount that I've accumulated. And part of my, you know, if, assuming I'm working and I don't need need to take withdrawals, what I will try and do over the next few years is do Roth IRA conversions to try and get some of that money out of a taxable account into a, into a tax, uh, tax exempt account, you know, which requires paying some taxes now, but, but I'm definitely doing that. The other thing I would say is, and I, I actually have done this in the last few weeks, that if you do Roth conversion, I mean, when you do a Roth conversion, uh, you want to, there's two, there's two issues. One, you want to do it when your tax rates lower. That's one, that's one issue. And the other thing is you want to do it, when the value of the asset is low, because if it's suddenly dropped down and then it's going to come spring back up, if you convert at that moment in time, you pay tax at the lower rate. And then when it springs back, that's all tax-free growth. So I've actually done that uh, a couple of times in the last uh, couple of weeks, you know, as I, as I think we're getting to the bottom, I've actually fired and, you know, and, and, and converted. And, and I think in most, I mean, if, for do it, if, if you're doing it yourself or, or with, you're working with an advisor, this is simple these days. You can just take an asset, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, I could just go in and, 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 and say I want to do a Roth conversion of a particular asset, and it's just converted in kind to the mm -hmm. Roth account. So as long as you have the two counts set up, you know, it took me three seconds to, to make this transaction. Yeah. Well, I myself, I, I didn't think we'd get in the tax discussion quite yet, but I myself <laughs> did a couple uh, Roth conversions, converted uh, what was left of my right wife's uh, IRA and myself yeah, this past week, just because of right. uh, the market pulling back. And it made a lot of sense. Now, you know, I, I'm in a pretty high tax bracket and many would say, well, you're going to be in a lower tax bracket in retirement. You know, why would you convert in such a high tax bracket? You know, my personal view is that taxes will be higher in the future. And, you know, whether they are or not, I don't really really like the idea of owing Uncle Sam money in the future, especially when the interest rate's unknown. Um, so I guess along those lines, how do you know, you know how does the average individual know um, how much is appropriate to convert when they're making this conversion? When is the appropriate time to make those conversions throughout the year? How do you kind of strategically do that? So how much and when and what? how much of that is dependent on the future of taxation and your view on that? So I have a lot of different questions in there. But yeah, it, it's well, it, again, I, I feel like it comes back to like, you need to just 
pick, you have to have a comfort level. You, you know, in the end, there's no perfect answer to that, you know, to any of those questions. I, I, it depends on, you know, some people end up, start off with a strategy and they say, okay, well, you know, in my case, if you're in early retirement, uh, some of my income right now is not taxable. But, and, and so, uh, you know, so, so, so I'm in a lower tax bracket now than I was when I was working full time and lower than I'll probably be once I start, start taking my, you know, required minimum distributions of 72. So, so if you, you know, you're looking for a lower than normal tax rate, if possible, is one situation. And then as we were just talking about the other, the other one is, is that you're looking to convert when the, uh, you know, when the market is down so that you're essentially eliminating taxes on a portion of the account. Um, and, and, and how much, like I said, some people will say, okay, well, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to try and convert, you know, until I maximize my 12% tax bracket, or they might go for the 22%. So it depends, you know, you have to sort of think that through and decide uh, how you want to do it. I, I think one of the things that's gotten harder, though, which, which I, I don't see that much written about this issue is that, you know, you have to do a conversion for a tax year before the end of the tax year, right? So you, if I want to do it in 2020, you have to do it by 1231. Well, in the past, I could, I could, I could undo that transaction, right? I could do a recharacterization, right? I could, I could, if I, if I wasn't sure if I wanted to convert, I could convert and then undo it. Well, we can't do that anymore. They got rid of that a couple of years ago. And so now when you make the decision to do a conversion, it is final. And, uh, you know, if, if you, if you guess wrong on the market and it goes down further, you know, you might be paying tax on, uh, on something that's now worth less than, than when, you know, than at, the, at the time you're paying tax than when you did the conversion. So, so you're kind of stuck with your decisions. I mean, it makes it a, a little bit harder. But I, 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 you know, I think it's one of these things that you decide how much can you know. You say to yourself, "This, this is how I talk to myself too." It's like yeah. I know this is a good idea. I know I don't want to pay taxes. What's my comfort level? Like, what, what, what am I willing to do? Uh, you know, in order to, uh, you know, in order to take advantage of this opportunity, but not feel like I've paid too much in tax. Uh, so you just kind of have to land somewhere. Um, it's also, I, I feel like um, I think about the issue, you know, when we talk about building an income floor and, you know, we said, you know, I said, I have so much of my income is, is, is in guaranteed income. And I, and I think, uh, you know, in all the literature and all the research and the academic approaches to this, we think of like, you try and build an income floor that covers your basic expenses. I, I didn't do that at all. Like, you know, yeah. it, basically I bought an income floor with this, you know, I just thought about how much of my portfolio was I willing to part with is really the answer is how much was I willing to give up control of. And it, it turned out to be about a quarter of it, you know, so, so I build as much income as I could buy with, you know, with, with, in all the different ways that I did it. I did it in a number of different ways, but um, I, you know, I ended up using about a quarter of my portfolio to do that. And that's what I was comfortable with. So, so I, I think those, one of those, it's, you know, like I say, these decisions, there's, it's a comfort level. There's a, how much can you part, you know, are you comfortable partying with, you know, it's a good idea, you know, like, so it's, it's, it, it isn't science. I don't think. <laughs> yeah. I, I feel like it's, it's this common theme that I'm hearing from you. It's education, yes. it's knowledge, and then it's, you know, comfort level. It's whatever fits best for your unique situation. And sometimes you have to, you know, ignore the academic approach, you know, maybe not entirely, but just because it's academically the best thing for you, it doesn't mean it's the best thing for you as an individual, because you might not be able to actually live with it in the first place. Right. And so the, the back half of that question was, you know, what do you, I mean, we're sitting here talking to an ex-professor of taxation. I, I would be remiss if I didn't ask the question about the future of tax rates. And I think you'll be able to tie in your answer to, um, you know, what, what your thoughts are on the future of tax rates to another one of our uh, fan questions. And this comes from Chris uh, Creeps, I believe I pronounced that correctly. Uh, Chris says, what are the tax planning scenarios that clients should be evaluating in their analysis of retirement income? So uh, it goes on to say, what are two to three scenarios that um, should be requested in a stress test uh, of potential changes in you know taxation in the future? So what are a couple scenarios that you might use to stress test a portfolio from a, a tax planning standpoint? And I think you can kind of tie in that future of taxation expectation discussion in there? Well, that, that's a very sophisticated listener. <laughs> I'm impressed with that question. <laughs> I'm not sure I've actually stress tested my, my strategy <laughs> that carefully. So, um, 
But if you have the right software, you, you can do that. And, and I guess I, I'm with you that I believe the tax rates have to go up. I mean, you know, now, you know, we've been in this place where we had this tremendous deficit and now we're to get us out of our current crisis, we're going to spend another trillion dollars. And, and it's, you know, you just, it's hard to imagine that we won't have future tax rates that are higher. One of the things I put in our, you know, I, I put in the curriculum, you know, and, and I think about this a lot. Like you say, do, do we really know anything about future tax rates? You know, when you're talking about a retiree, someone who's approaching retirement and you say, well, you know, you'd know a couple of things, you know, if you're a married couple that at one, at some time, one of you is going to die. And now you're going to be in a, you're going to be a single taxpayer. And suddenly your tax rate's going to go up a lot. You know, if you have similar income, you know, if, if your income goes down 20% and you go from a joint taxpayer to single taxpayer, your tax rate's going to go up. There's no question about it. So we know that. We know that if people are older, let's say in their 70s or 80s, and they're going to be leaving qualified money to their kids, you know, they, they know where their kids are, you know, in terms of their tax rates. And they might be, their kids might be in a higher tax rate than they are. So, you know, there are some things we know we know about tax rates, you know, um, and then if we do have a situation where, you know, you're a retiree and you, you know, you give a lot of money to charity for a year or you, uh, for some other reason, you have lower income than usual, you know, you know that you're currently in a lower than your average or your regular tax rate. That's a good time to, to, to take action. But I, I mean, I, I have to think I mean, I, most people I know, I, I think, believe that tax rates are probably as low as they're ever going to be, uh, you know, than, in, the near, you know <laughs> in the next 30 years, maybe. So so I, I think we, you know, a lot of people are trying to take advantage of that, you know, and yeah. do things now, you know, increase their income and pay tax at a lower rate in order to, uh, in order to get to a tax-free environment. You know, you said something earlier that I, I think about uh, a lot is, you um, this idea that when you do a Roth IRA conversion and you pay some tax on it now, uh, you sort of said, you know, I, I like that I, I'm paying a, a tax obligation, so I don't have to pay in the future. And it's a known quantity right now. I know how much it's going to cost me. In the future, I don't know. Uh, and so I've, I've just eliminated really a, a very, you know, a very important uncertainty that you face in retirement. I mean, when you get to retirement, if you have all your money in tax deferred plans and tax rates go way up, something's going to happen to your plan. You know, this question was about stress testing the plan. You're, you're either going to have to, you know, live on less or you're going to have to take more withdrawals from your portfolio to get the same taxable income. So, so I feel like this idea of doing conversions is a good way to eliminate that, that, you know, getting at least some of your money in a tax-free environment is a really great way to deal with that fact that we don't know where tax yeah. rates will be. I think that's kind of at the core of our planning process is just eliminating as much uncertainty as we possibly can. And in one way we're doing that is with, you know, taxation. Another way we can do that is a step that you took, which is creating some guaranteed income, creating some kind of income floor. You did that through annuities and you've used that a word several times here. Um, can you kind of talk through your annuity strategy? How did you select the right annuity? What type of annuities do you own? Um, are annuities good or bad? Well, it's, it's interesting. I, I feel like um, the, the, the job, what I was looking for, and I think we're all looking for this, I was looking for the lowest cost approach to building more guaranteed lifetime income. Now, everyone's view of lifetime income is different depending on their, usually their family's history. And my father lived 104. So I assume I'm going to live to, you know, 110. <laughs> and so like, to me, you know, my father got a great deal by buying a life annuity. To me, it's a good deal, you know, even as, even as an investment, because I'm going to live a long time, you know? So, so I, I, I so I, I have to say that I do have that bias, you know, I have a, a bias uh, to think that, you know, I, but, but even for people who don't know, you know, aren't, don't know how long they're going to live. I mean, I just keep, when I just keep saying to myself, like, why would you, you know, the worst thing that can happen to you is that you don't have enough resources later in your life when you don't have any ability to create any more resources. You're not going back to work when you're 85 or 90, you know, like you can't do anything about it then. Um, and, and, you know, and the fact if you were to, you know, to die young and have, you know, and, and, and have a lot of money, like everybody's worried about like what happens if they die young and, 
you know, they didn't get their money's worth out of the annuity. It's like, who cares? If you died, you don't care anymore. Like you should be really, wor- what you should worry about is what happens when you're 90 and you don't have enough resources. I mean, that's what, that's what keeps me up at night, you know, cause you know, so, so like one, I'm not going to let that happen. That happen to me. So, so when I think of this job of building an income floor, it was like, well, how do I do that in a cost-effective way? And step one is absolutely defer Social Security to 70. I mean, that's, that's the first place. That's the cheapest place to buy more income. Uh, one of the other professors and I at the college um, a couple of years ago, we wrote an article about this. We like, I, I'm not a real numbers guy. This is Kirk Okamura. He, he loves to do, run numbers. And we said, you know, I bet we could quantify that. Like you say, all right, I defer Social Security from 65 to 70. Um, that's going to cost me. I'm going to give up this amount of benefits, right? I'm going to give mm-hmm. up so much a month. Right. And then we figure out how much, if I bought a SPIA, a, a five-year term certain annuity, how much would that cost to cover that gap? And then we compared to that to what if we went out and tried to buy, let's take benefits at 65 instead of 70, and let's try and buy that annuity that's inflation-adjusted annuity that starts at 70. And, and, and which, is the, which is cheaper? You know, is it cheaper to uh, buy an annuity or is it cheaper to defer Social Security? And, and I'm sure this won't surprise you, the numbers were really different. I mean, like the, the commercial annuity was much more expensive uh, than the social security approach. And, and clearly it was the best value for that married couple, for the person with the larger of the two benefits, it was by far the best value, you know, for mm-hmm. those people to, to defer. It was the cheapest. So, so really it is, we, what we were testing is, is it the cheapest way to add income? And I think we proved that, yes, it, it was. I mean, it is fact specific for each case, but, but it was, Pretty, it was over a hundred thousand dollars difference. If we were talking about someone eligible for the maximum benefit, um, it was a hundred thousand dollars cheaper to defer Social Security than to try and buy an annuity that would replace that benefit. So, um, so that's the first place you start. And then I had a frozen pension, and and a lot of people don't take. Everybody takes the lump sum. You know, they don't take the annuity. I took the annuity. You know, from from the from the pension plan. So that's the second. That was the second place I built um, the floor from. And then I started thinking about annuity products. Uh, how, would I, how would I do that? And how would I do that in a cost-effective way? And I, you know, I had sort of almost forgotten that I had a, a fairly modest uh, old variable annuity that I purchased many years ago, you know, non-qualified annuity. I got an inheritance from an uncle, and I decided to, you know, to save some of it for retirement. Well, that grew, of course, you know, over, over the years. And uh, when I went and checked, I thought, well, why don't I look and see what the conversion rate and that deferred annuity would be if I actually annuitized? Would I get a good payout rate compared to commercial annuities today? And it turned out that it was amazing. I mean, it was much better conversion rate. And I was allowed to add to that. So one of my strategies over the last couple of years was to add to that. And I recently have turned that on, that annuity. And the payout rate was seven and a half percent instead of probably six and a half percent that it would be with commercial annuity. Uh, so, so that, uh, so that, that was really an aha. I didn't realize that that would be the case. So you have to look around and, and see. So I did that. And then my, my partner, my spouse is 10 years older than I am. So we bought a deferred a couple of years ago, a deferred income annuity just on his life only because that we got a really good payout rate. So, so I'll, you know, we'll, I'll replace that you know, if, if he were to die first, I'll replace that in other ways. But, but that was, a, you know, so that was a way to, to build income. So I, I, I've sort of done everything. And I even have an indexed annuity uh, with a guaranteed withdrawal benefit rider. Um, so we've done income annuities. I've got a, I had a variable annuity. I have a, an indexed annuity. Um, I, I think I probably started off this process thinking that you, you know, that, that income annuities were best. And then I really learned that you just look for the best price, you know, and that they all have a purpose in different situations. Um, and the other, the other thing that happens is there's a tax, there's a tax issue here too, and an RMD issue um, that if you try to put an income annuity inside of an IRA, when you go to take out your required distributions, you don't get to aggregate the withdrawals from that income annuity with your other IRA withdrawals. So you end up, in the end, you end up having to take out more taxable money. You have to take out the annuity payment and still take out all your RMDs from your other accounts, your remaining accounts. But if you have an indexed annuity or a variable annuity with a withdrawal benefit rider, 
that's still treated like an individual account and you still and you get to aggregate the withdrawals from that you know it gets to, it counts towards meeting your rmds from all your iras so that becomes a play so all it, it's it's complicated <laughs> and, and as i say that i i've ended up i do have one of each of the major types of annuity products and they all fit nicely into the plan uh, you say it's complicated and i think people hear that and go oh well annuities are complicated and i don't know it, it sounds to me we talked about tax planning we talked about income planning we you know brush the surface on investment planning you talk about health care i mean the whole process is complicated. The stock market is complicated. You know, if you really start to think about it and get oh, into yeah. strategies. And so I, I'm just wondering from, from your point of view, as you do take an academic approach, I mean, yeah, I know in talking to Dr. Wade Fowl, uh, one of your colleagues previously, I asked him, you know, why he wrote the investment, uh, only the investment first approach uh, to retirement income planning before he wrote the safety first approach. He said he didn't want to get uh, crucified by other, you know, by the industry. Uh, right. He didn't want to get marked in a certain way. And as, you know, selling annuities for some, as if he was actually selling annuities in the first place. But why do you think there is all this, you know, there are there's just this line in the sand. It seems like largely in the financial industry, where you know either you love annuities, you see their place, or there's just this hate for the product. It seems, and it you know, bleeds into the consumer. Yeah, and 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 I feel bad for consumers having to see all that because it it doesn't make any it doesn't make any sense if we just took away the emotion and just looked at like you know do these do these products and strategies have a, a have a place in the plan of many for many retirees. I think the answer is yes, and I and I think the advise honestly. I think uh, the advisor who doesn't look at all investment and insurance solutions for retirement income planning is doing their client a disservice. So so I'm in. I guess I'm in Wade's camp. I mean, I, I definitely you know Wade is one of the people I've learned from, and I and I definitely believe that um, uh, that you need to consider both both types. I mean that both things fit together. And, and I, and I think, you know, we talked about, uh, I, I said annuities are complex and I want to kind of finish that. And you said, oh yeah, it, it is, as you're thinking about buying them. And it, and it did, it was complex as, as you go through the process. But once you turn on an income stream, nothing could be simpler, right? I mean, I get a check going to my checking account every month for the rest of my life, you know, and I think that ultimately, you know, I think Wade's, a lot of Wade's work, you know, finds that the, the best strategy is really just an income stream through annuity products and, and social security combined with a portfolio mainly of equities. So the, the annuities are your bonds and the, and the portfolio is your, is your equity exposure. And it's actually not all that, com that's not actually all that complicated. Right. If you have an income stream and then you have a portfolio that you're going to take some specified withdrawals from, you know, or if you can afford it, you take less than that and, and you're, there you go. I mean, there's your plan. I mean, there's not a lot to, to change over time. So, so annuities seem complicated to start off with, but, um, and I, I think I kept being guided to, when I think about the, you know, having guaranteed income, all the research shows that people are happier when they have income. Like, and that makes sense. Like you don't want to spend down your portfolio. It's terrifying, you know, but do you want to spend your monthly annuity where you know you're going to get another check next month, you can't wait to spend it. You know, it's a totally different experience. And I know, um, you know, Michael Fink has done some research on that and, and has found that. And, and, and I'm like, I, you know, I, I'm willing to take a lot of risk. However, I, you know, once you move into retirement, like I have no intention of staying up at night worried about my investments. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I, I want plenty of income to fall back on and I want it to, forever. You know, I mean, the whole idea that it's an insurance product that will last as long as I do, which I have no idea how long that will be, uh, is, is very appealing to me. You know, so I, um, I don't know. I, you know, when I hear that the hate for annuities is, is, you know, it's silly. It's like the hate for reverse mortgages. It's the same thing. It's they're tools that are useful in some situations, you know, if somebody, you know, if you've got an advisor who hates a product or a solution, I go to another advisor. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, really, I mean, it's just not appropriate. You know, advisors are supposed to be dispassionate. They're not supposed to hate things. They're supposed to help you pick the, you can hate things as a consumer, but, but your advisor shouldn't 
hate things, you know. Right. <laughs> you know, I, and I think we'd be doing uh, the listener a disservice if we didn't you know, kind of talk about the different types of news. Just, you know, from a high, I think a lot of the confusion and a lot of the issue that the consumer has is just confusion over uh, the different types of annuities. Yeah, the media kind of dumps them all into one bucket and that there's a lot of different types. You said you've owned um, all the different major types of annuities. And so I want to wrap up this annuity discussion and move on. However, um, could you just give the listener an easy way to, you know, just a, a how do you understand basically what those different types of annuities are? What are they? And, you know, you know, how do they work? Well, I, th- I think if you were tying them all together, I mean, if, in, when you talk about an older individual, like who's planning for their retirement needs, so you're in your fifties or sixties and you're thinking of annuities, you're looking for something that's going to provide you an income stream, you know, a guaranteed income stream. And there's a couple of, and, and all the different types of annuities will allow you to do that in, in kind of different ways. So, so we'll talk about that in a second. If you're, if you're a younger person, an annuity is sort of a, it can be a, is a different thing. It's a way to save for retirement. It's, a, it's got tax advantages. Um, you know, so a deferred annuity for a younger person, that's an accumulation vehicle that you're using because you want to defer taxes. You know, it's, it's a totally kind of different thing. So in income planning, I, I do tend to think of it's not as complicated because whether we're using a, an income annuity or a, an indexed annuity or a variable annuity, essentially we're, in my mind, I'm using those products in order to, to generate a guaranteed income stream. Now there's absolutely, it's interesting in my own, you know, my own life, since I own all these products, you take out, you know, I bought a deferred income annuity for my partner, right? So you buy this product, you give them, you know, we gave, I don't know what the premium was. Let's say it's $100,000. Give them $100,000. You get one page back that says, all right, you put it, this is the premium. Your benefit's going to be this much. It's going to start on this date and it's going to stop whenever. You know, it's in our case, we bought a single life annuity. It'll stop after the first death and that's it. So there's absolutely no question that the contract involved in an income annuity, you know, a def- like it, whether it's immediate or deferred, is extremely simple and it's easy to read what it is and it's easy to keep track of. It's got a premium, it's got a start date, it's got an annuity amount and it's got an end date, you know? So for a lot of people, you know, will buy an annuity that doesn't just pay for life. It also has guaranteed payments for 10 years or maybe they buy a joint survivor. So something happens after the annuitant dies. So, so the, the, but that's it. Those are the terms. Now I have an I have an indexed annuity that has a withdrawal benefit rider that has about, you know, 300 pages in the contract mm-hmm. of how that works. Looks like a mutual fund perspective. It's, it's quite <laughs> disturbing, actually. But um, in the end, uh, it depends if you're using these other products. Um, they're not that complicated if what you're doing is, bu- is trying to buy an income stream, right? So like an indexed annuity if you were using that as a way to, you know, participate in the market, but you don't you know, want downside protection, that's one way of using it. But in retirement income planning, I, I'm using an index annuity that has a promise that says, you know, on a specified date, if you turn, if you want to, you're going to start receiving, you know, a benefit of a certain amount, right? So, so I can, I can buy, you know, it's, it's, you know, withdrawal benefit rider allows me to, you know, buy an annuity that I know in some future date that I'm going to get X amount of income. And, and to me, that's, you know, if, because that's the way I was buying it and that's what I bought, I could compare the income with that approach to how much I would get with an income annuity or with a, a variable annuity with a rider. And then I could very easily decide which was the best deal because I was just looking for income. Mm-hmm. So, so, in re- so I don't think it's that complicated in retirement income planning. If you think about, if you're using the annuity, primarily to build a guaranteed income stream. Uh, And then what's nice about uh, an income, I mean, income writers are so complicated that they really turn people off and they, and people worry about, you know, how do they work and did I get ripped off and all that. But, but really they did, they were built to serve a purpose, which is one, you don't know when you want to start the income. Well, I've discovered this in my, you know, in my, you know, as I was planning for retirement, I kept changing my retirement date. Many people don't know when they're going to start their income. Um, if, I, if I buy an income annuity 
you know, even that starts in the future, I have to pick a date. Now, those products sometimes allow you to change the date, but, but you know, with a, with a rider product, you get to turn it on whenever you want to. The other thing is that these, these products with income riders, what they really were intended to do is that, you know, they, they were built to address um, objections that were coming up from, from consumers that would say like, well, wait, once I turn on this, if you're saying once I turn it into an income annuity, there's no more account balance. What happens if I die tomorrow? I, I'm upset about that. I, I'd be concerned about. So I said, oh, well, let's come up with a hybrid. Let's come up with a product that says you can take out this amount each month from your portfolio. I mean, from your annuity account, uh, and that uh, it'll actually come out of your account. But we'll guarantee that if you if your account goes down to zero that we'll continue paying that amount for as long as you live. So it's, it's the same kind of a promise. It's a lifetime income promise, but it works in conjunction with a, a sort of a decreasing account balance over time. Mm-hmm. And in my own planning, because my spouse is 10 years older than I am, uh, what, this, what happens with this account that, that's in my name is that uh, what if I were to die young? Well, do you still have the account balance? And it turns into a death benefit for him, right? So... So, so it actually, you know, it works well for us. So mm-hmm. does that help? I don't know. I yeah. Mean, yeah. You it's, kind of cover the different types, right? You've got the, just a straight income annuity, guaranteed income, kind of uh, the lose control part. Right. Then you've got the fixed index, which upside, you know, potential downside protection with an income guarantee that you can turn on at some point in the future. Variable annuities can work the same way. You just don't have the downside protection on your account value. So I think that's the high level of understanding yeah. those different types. And I think with, with variable annuities, if you're buying it for income, even though there's no downside protection, there can be, there can be a promised, you know, withdrawal amount over time. So like, you, right. so even though the account balance doesn't have downside protection, the income portion could have some downside protection. You sure. know, they're guaranteeing an income amount, you know, based on some phantom roll up rate and all that complex stuff. But it's, but in the end, you're just looking for an income stream. And really the difference with this rider approach versus a income annuity is this idea that you lose control over this account balance yeah. at some time. So let's say that we take this approach. We do a flooring approach. As you've said, you're using, you're securing about two thirds of your income. And then you've got this other third. You said at some point that'll involve, you know, generating that extra income from your investment portfolio. So if someone's going to use this strategy, um, what kind of, what kind of strategy are you using or what kind of advice would you give somebody if they're going to take withdrawals from their investment portfolio to supplement that floored income? You know, should there be a strategy there or is it just the old 4% rule? Well, so, so, you know, when you look at it, you look at the research, you know, um, the research was all done. The 4% rule was saying, okay, let's assume you're going to take 4% of the portfolio value at the time you retire. And then every year you're going to take, that plus inflation, right? Well, I think we've all learned that that's not a good idea. Like it's probably a good idea if you're going to pick a withdrawal rate, whether it's 4% or 5% or whatever, it should be the, it should be the percent, the way I'm going to do it is it's going to be a percentage of the value of my account currently, right? So if the account goes down, I'm going to take out less. If the account goes up, I'll take out a little more. Mm-hmm. So, so I think one of the things we've learned is that it is, is that if you, your portfolio is likely to last longer, if you're willing to make changes in how much you withdraw based on the value of the account. So I think that that's even, that's actually almost simpler. You just say, okay, all right, the market's down a lot. You know, I should take out less. I think that's intuitive. People kind of get that mm-hmm. and I'll take out. And the thing is, as long as if you're willing to vary your spending, you can afford to actually increase your withdrawal rate a little bit. So maybe you can afford 5% withdrawal rate. So, you, you know, you can take out a little bit more as long as you're taking it out of the current value and not this idea that you're going to get some, you know, it's, you're going to treat it like it's an annuity and it's going to be inflation adjusted every year. You know, you're just going to take out the amount based on the value of your portfolio. And, if you, and that's actually a pretty simple thing. You just sort of have that in mind. That you know, each year you're not going to take out more than five percent of the current value of the portfolio. You know, you're going to, you know, that portfolio is going to last for you. I mean, it's, you know, I mean, it's 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 a it's a really good approach. And if you take, and if you're going to be more and more aggressive in your investing, you got more volatility. Well, you're just going to have a little more volatility in your spending. That's the role of the guaranteed income. That's why you have the income floor to make sure you have some regular income, and then this. You know, from the portfolio, you have variable income, 
you know, which is fine. It's kind of fun, right? Like you have a great year, you spend a little more, you go on a nicer vacation. You know, that's, you know, we yeah. all, we all look forward to upside. You know? yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. I think so. that's one of the things that, you know, some retirees don't get, you're still going to be retired. You're still going to be investing for the next, you know, typically 30 years at least. And, right. and so you do have a time horizon to continue to invest in the markets, just maybe not on all the dollars that you've stepped into retirement with. And right. you know, Dave, I, I know we're running out of time, but I've got a couple uh, high level general, more general questions. Would you okay. have some time for that? Uh-huh. Great. Um, so, so what, what has been your biggest surprise, uh, in this whole retirement transition? Um, so we talk about asking, you know, I, I teach advisors, you know, how to do retirement income planning and we have all this material on how, oh, well, before they get to retirement, you should help them figure out what they're going to do with their time and how much it's going to cost their retirement and, and all these questions that I realize now that I'm actually going through it myself you actually can't do that. I mean, it's really hard to do that. Like it's very hard to predict how you're going to spend your time in the future. Should you have some general ideas of what your goals are? And, you know, as I say, I, I want to get back with what I understand, you know, about financial planning. I want to get back to consumers, but I don't know exactly what that will look like. Um, even these issues about like when you're going to retire, um, that, that that's really hard. Like I changed my mind six times, you know, so, so, um, you know, I was in a work environment that I wasn't very happy in, and then it improved, and I was willing to stay longer. You know, I mean, it's those things happen to people. You know, so, so um, I think it's really hard to to plan. That was a surprise how hard it was to answer these questions that we ask people. But I also have learned that I'm glad I did plan. You still have to plan for something. You know, like you still need a baseline. And I think for a lot of people, if when this is uncertain, just planning on having the same cost of living when after you retire that you had prior to retirement is is not a bad place to start i mean that's you know that's that's a that's just a good baseline if you can't exactly figure this out um so i'm glad i did some planning for a certain amount of income and a certain retirement date but uh as i say this stuff you know it it, it changes all the time and it's really hard to it's really hard to do you know to, to figure it out I mean, now it's was a there constant, it's a constant process in going through this process and asking yourself these questions, you said, you know, some of them were just really difficult to nail down an answer to. Is there one in particular that was the hardest question to answer? No, they're all hard. I mean, <laughs> I mean, just think of it like when I was going to retire. I mean, I just kept thinking that like when I'm going to retire, I'm not sure. You know, is it going to cost me more or less in retirement? Well, I don't know because I'm thinking like we've been talking, thinking about moving to, you know, to Tucson. We like Tucson. Well, Tucson's cheaper than Philadelphia. So like, you know, that would make my life cheaper, but I don't, I, we haven't decided to do that yet. We don't think the poodles will like Tucson. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we haven't decided this yet. So like I said, that I mean, each and every one of these like really critical decisions that affect how much your life will cost in retirement were virtually impossible to make before I got here. And even in retirement, you know, I still haven't decided if we're going to move at some point in the near future, you know, so so it's, it's just, uh, you know, no, it, it surprised me how hard all of them are. <laughs> I, well, I guess that's the value in getting ahead of the game, starting to think about this early. And what you've done is made a, you know, kind of a partial retirement transition. You gave yourself some additional time to kind of experience what retirement feels like. Yeah. And I, I think the, hard, the hardest part, if you stay, if you do what I did, which is, you know, working full time for the American College. And then I go to part, basically, you know, part-time an hourly worker working for the American College is how do you change your psychology like that you, that you don't just feel like you're living the same life, you know, so you, you want to make sure that for me, I think about, um, uh, I think about, you know, my day differently, you know, work doesn't come first. I think about the part of the day that's going to be with my family and with the poodles and how I'm going to have some fun. And then I fit work into that. So the way I sort of think about my day is different. We have a great at our um, at, the, at our um, retirement income website at the college. We did a video a long time ago that I love with a woman named Anna Rappaport, who's uh, an actuary, and she's very heavily involved in this. But she 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 talked about like how to be successful in a phased retirement, and that's what she was saying was was some of these things like make sure that you rethink. You, you, you got to look at work differently. Now work is, you know, for me now work, you have to think about like work is now um, something I'm doing because I want to do it, not something that I have to do. Uh, work comes, doesn't come first. It comes after these other things. 
one of the things I've let, I've tried to let go, and I'm doing it pretty successfully, maybe to my surprise, I'm not worried about the American college anymore. It's not my business. You know, like that's a big deal. Like, you know, we all get so wrapped up in the places we work and how well they're doing and, and, and your role in that, um, that, you know, that it's hard to let go of that, you know, the, the, the politics and the concerns and the worries. It's not my problem anymore. Like, I hope they stay around so that I can, you know, keep getting some income from them. But that that's the extent of my concern about the American college <laughs> at this point. And I, but that takes some, you know, I had to, you have to kind of think about that. So, so I feel my challenge has been, um, one of my challenges has been how to sort of not change my life that much, but change the way I think about my life a lot, which, which I really have done. And that takes some time, you know, changing yeah. your thinking, you know, spending some time on your thinking. I think that's a good, good takeaway there. Now, right. talking about your thinking, you know, so Dave, you're in your mid 60s. Now you've partially transitioned into retirement. Retirement's already occurred in your mind. Uh, right. If you were to rewind the clock, say, uh, you could go back, take yourself today and, and give 50 year old Dave some guidance. What would you say? Or what would you do differently? Um, I don't know. I'm not, I'm, I'm not much of a regret kind of person. So I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not, I can't think of anything that I would do differently. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of like the trajectory of my life. It's gone, gone pretty well and it's been pretty interesting. There's been a lot of phases. So um, I, I think, I think it's, you know, going in the direction that I like it, but I don't think I go, I probably wouldn't change it. I, I wish, you know, maybe I could have changed some things about the Marin college in the past, but I could have done that anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, if someone's out there, they're listening, let's say they're 10 years from retirement, what would your advice be to them at that stage versus those that are currently transitioning already in retirement? Well, you, you just do the best you can to prepare, which, you know, as I say, it's hard to know what that's going to exactly look like, but, but the preparation at that phase really isn't that complicated. It's primarily saving as much as you possibly can, uh, which, you know, means, using using retirement plans you know saving efficiently through you know tax deferred plans or tax exempt roth you know roth vehicles um it's you know trying to pay a little you know starting to pay attention you know i think 10 years from retirement you start to think a little bit about what you want that to look like and, and when you might want it to happen uh because that's going to affect how much you need to save and and so forth so i think that's i think that's important um yeah, I think the other thing is, you know, a lot of the other 10 years from retirement, you're not doing a lot of other planning other than some of you start to deal with some of the risks face to face you face in retirement. So, you know, 55 is a good time to be thinking about long term care insurance or dealing with that kind of a solution. Remember, uh, you can't you know, you can't buy long term care insurance or even uh, one of these hybrid life insurance products if you're not healthy enough to buy it, you know, so. So, so that's a risk that you want to start taking off the table before you get to retirement. Uh, and then I do see more people thinking about annuities because they don't have pension plans at work. Today, people are buying at 55, buying deferred income annuities that might start at 65 or 70 um, and uh, to take some risk off the table and to start to build an income stream. Uh, and that, I think that's another thing that people might think of doing. Awesome. Well, let's wrap it up with one real philosophical question. Uh, what does purpose and retirement mean to you? Or how would you um, define purpose and retirement? I, I think it's, you know, I, I, I read, I'm, I'm not even gonna be able to tell you the title of the book, but I just found some book on like how to have meaning in retirement. And it sort of takes you through, you know, the, the experience of like thinking about what is important to you and how you want to spend your time. So I think it's like, you know, to, to me, having a meaningful retirement means having now I have control over my time and I want to spend it in a way that means something to me, you know, and that that, uh, that gives back. So when I say I want to give back, uh, you know, my knowledge about retirement planning, I'm a, a fencing coach. I was an Olympic fencer. I was in the 1988 Olympics in, in Korea and I coached fencing over the years and I, I like to give back that way. So so it's like finding finding ways to, uh, you know, to, to, to have, uh, you know, th thinking through how you want to, it's really starting to think about your legacy. How do you want to, what do you want to leave to the world when you're gone? You know, and, and you, and you want to, I think that's a very exciting way to, to go into your retirement, thinking about what do you want to accomplish? It's a whole new, I mean, I'm excited about it. It's a whole new phase of life, lots of opportunity, lots of time. I have oceans of time in front of me to, 
you know, that I now have control over and uh, I, I can do what I want with it. And so I'm, I, I'm, I'm trying to spend the time this first year really kind of thinking through those things. What, what is it that I want to accomplish before I, I, I go try and do that? So. <laughs> Well, that's beautiful, Dave. And you are giving, you are serving others. You know, you didn't have to jump on this interview here today, but you did. And well, you this gave. was fun. I, so, I really enjoyed it. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. I, I truly appreciate this. And I've got another conversation in mind. So okay. hopefully we have the opportunity to do this again in uh, the relatively near future. So thanks again, Dave. We'll, we'll Sounds catch good. you soon. All right. Bye-bye.